everyone, it's great to be here. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Peria and I am the CEO and founder of Model Expand, which is a diversity and inclusion advisory firm. And I was previously at Hackbright, which was the first coding school for women in the US. And I'm really excited to talk to everyone about non-traditional candidates. So let's get straight to it. We'll talk about what does that mean and how do you create a recruiting process that's inclusive to this new wave of talent that's coming in. So. So what, is, what are non-traditional candidates? So we often associate software engineers with having a computer science degree. But the reality is over the past few years, people are learning in alternative ways. So it could be boot camps, it could be community colleges where there's technical training, there's, um, you know, there's self-taught through online programs. There's so many alternative ways of learning and getting that skill set that you need to be an engineer. So when I was at Hackbright about four or five years ago, folks didn't really, know what a coding school was or what a boot camp even was. So, you know, we'd talk to employers and say, hey, look, these women, they're graduating, they, um, they have the skills to be software engineers, they have a growth mindset, they've had experience in a professional setting, so it's not like new grads. And they'd say, great, that sounds good, where'd they get their computer science degree from? And we'd say, no, they don't have one. And I would say, the collective response <laughs> was that. <laughs> Uh, it's a hard pill to swallow, right? How can you be a software engineer without having that computer science degree? But four to five years into it, the proof is in the pudding, right? We have, you know, these are just a few examples, but non-traditional candidates are all over tech companies right now. So Rose Trujillo, she's the engineering team lead at Zendesk. We have um, Stephanie Duke, senior engineering manager at Credit Karma. Wendy's at Netflix. Kika Lamo is at Heroku. The point is, is it works. And none of these folks have computer science degrees. So is everyone excited now to learn how to recruit this group? Yeah. <laughs> OK, so how do you do it? So first things first, set up partnerships with the programs that are out there. Diversify your recruiting sources. There are so many programs that are focused on, on uh, non-traditional talent, on really upskilling different groups. So like Breakline is up here. They train, um, they train veterans. We have uh, this community college in San Francisco. They're focused on security training. At Hackbright, Make School, there's so many out there. You want to formalize the partnership for two reasons. One, make it a systematic part of your recruiting process. And second, imposter syndrome is real even for non-traditional candidates. They see that you know, other people have CS degrees. So when you create that formal part partnership, it sends a message of, you know, we're excited to learn about you, and it doesn't matter what school you went to. We we're just want to see what skill set you have. So number one, diversify your recruiting sources. And then second, shifting the mindset at your companies from a degree focused um, to skills focused. So this is a shift that companies are going to have to make in general. If you look at the numbers, um, 2015, for example, there was only about 60,000 CS grads. That same year, there was nearly half a million open computing jobs. And that number is just growing, right, with healthcare becoming more technical, banking. I mean, industries are getting more and more technical. The demand is just getting stronger. So if you're just focusing on CS grads, your talent pool is pretty small. And if you're focused on diversity, the reality is, is you're systematically you're at a disadvantage because even with CS grads, it's about 20%, for example, are women. Nearly 40% of boot camp grads are women. And that's the same as, um, as far as socioeconomic background, racial and ethnic diversity. You just see a lot more when you work with this group. So making that mindset shift to less degrees, more about skills, you could do that in two ways. Remove that CS requirement from the job description, just making it inclusive to people with different backgrounds. And then second, making sure that your teams, even once people come in for the interviews, making sure that they don't have a bias, uh, they don't have a bi five minute <laughs> warning, um, that that bias with the CS grad isn't present. So you can deal with that with unconscious bias training, using tools like interviewing.io, where it really helps your team measure for skills versus do they have the degree or not. So, so some of you may say, okay, I'm convinced, but I have a lot of people that I need to go back and convince to do this. So what, what can we do? So that's a common problem. So what's been showing up is apprenticeship programs. These are becoming more and more popular. And it's a nice bridge from that non-traditional background to getting a full-time software engineering role. So apprenticeship programs are good for two reasons. Number one is um, 
it's that bridge. So if you have internal stakeholders that are a little bit, you know, wary about taking away that CS degree, this gives them direct experience with non-traditional candidates where they can see the talent. And secondly, also imposter syndrome. So sometimes people from non-traditional training don't feel as comfortable um, applying for that full-time software engineering position, but apprenticeship programs really help them feel more comfortable. So let's take a look at what some other some of the companies have been doing. So we have Twilio, they have Hatch, which is a six-month program. And non-traditional candidates come in and they work with the product engineering team. They work on solutions for Twilio.org. They also um, learn about Twilio's best practices. There's Airbnb. They have a program called Connect for data science and software engineering. Six months, you work with the engineering team and you also work on um, a computer science curriculum that they have at the same time as you're learning the engineering. And then Facebook's program is a little bit longer. It's one year and you work with two different engineering teams with uh, the Facebook program. So these are just some examples, but they're getting more and more popular as a way to open up recruiting. So what they all have in common, hands-on experience, continuous learning, and mentorship. Really, if you're gonna look into apprenticeship programs, that's the kind of structure that you wanna create. And the average time span is about six months to a year. So is everybody ready to get started and create these programs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, so action items to take home. Diversify your recruiting sources. Okay, really look into that. And then also advocate for um, removing that CS requirement. And then last but not least, start assessing for a um, apprenticeship program. And you can start small, it does not have to be big. I've seen companies do it with a cohort of like four or five, test it out, see how it goes, and then what I've seen work is it ultimately becomes a funnel of talent over time. So um, hopefully everybody here is gonna go get started. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, perry at modelexpand.com. <laughs>